Hi, everyone, and welcome. We have some folks that are still joining us, so sit tight, and we'll be starting in just a minute. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, From a Clerk's Desk, What You Need to Know About Social Media, featuring Carrie Egbert, the City Clerk from Sydney, Ohio. Before we get started, I just want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. First off, everyone here is on mute, but please do feel free to use the question function in your control panel to submit questions to Carrie and Anil today. We're gonna have some time at the end of the presentation for Q&A, so definitely let us know if you want us to address something you're thinking about during the presentation. And then following the webinar, keep your eyes out. We'll be sending out some follow-up documentation that you'll be able to reference moving forward. If you are joining us today as part of the IIMC online learning webinar program, we're going to be reaching out to you with a learning assessment following the webinar, and of course, we'll be getting you the certificate of completion so you can get your credits for advanced education. So today's agenda, there are three of us on the phone today that you're gonna hear from. First, you're gonna hear from Carrie, where she's gonna share what you need to know about social media, and that will last about 20 minutes. Next, Anil Chavla from Archive Social will be reviewing legal policy and records, what specifically is new, and then I will be facilitating that Q&A with Carrie and Anil to answer your questions that we received both before and after the, uh, and during the webinar. So let's talk about Carrie. So Carrie has spent 26 years in local government and has seen a fair share of technology changes from the early 10-based team networks to cloud-based applications. And um, she has spent three years as a computer operator with the Shelby County Jobs and Family Services Office, 17 years as an administrative assistant with the Village of Minster, and one year as a fiscal officer for the Village of Versailles before landing her dream job as a city clerk for the city of Sydney. She's been there for almost five years. Um, so Carrie earned an Associate of Applied Business and Microcomputer Applications from Edison State Community College and a Bachelor of Science in Business slash e-business from the University of Phoenix. Carrie is also a certified Microsoft Office user specialist, a lifelong learner, and self-described workflow automation guru. When she's not working to keep her members of council out of trouble, you'll likely find Carrie at a campground with her husband, Ryan, or in front of her computer, adding relatives to the 20,000 plus in her Ancestry.com account. She also has two teenage sons that she is certain still love her tremendously, even if they don't say out loud very often. Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Carrie, you there? Sorry, there I am. Show my screen. There you are. Yes, there some you are. Slight technical some slight technical difficulties. Thank you, Erica. Um, 
I'm happy to be here today to share with you a few of the um, tips that I've learned about social media and archiving it and how it is changing the way we communicate with our residents and most importantly, impacting our um, record keeping. So today I will talk a lot about Facebook because we are a community that relies heavily on Facebook, but it's important to remember that social media is more than just Facebook. So whatever solution you choose to archive your social media, you should make sure it ultimately archives all the platforms your agency uses. Like I said, in Sydney, we use Facebook but we do have a limited following on Twitter, LinkedIn, and we do have a small following on YouTube. Just to give you a quick look at how um, social media has impacted how we communicate with our residents, we started into our social media um, venture back in 2014, so just right before I started with the city of Sydney. So about five years ago, our Facebook page had 864 likes. Fast forward to today, and that page has mushroomed into 8,177 likes, and 8,379 followers of all ages. What's impressive about that is that number is equal to about 30% of our actual population, which is around 21,000 people. So you're probably thinking, why should I archive social media? Well, by definition of public record, there really is no difference between this and this. We all have our records room that looks somewhat like the first picture where there are stacks of paper documents and file folders, but there really is no difference between those analog records and all the records we create and store digitally. Just like other forms of electronic communica communication, such as email, communication via social media can be a public record and agencies have an obligation to comply with those records laws. In all 50 states, social media is considered a public record and you do have that obligation to comply with your open records law. It's important to remember it's the content of the communication, not the format. So whether it's email or social media or some other form of digital communication that makes that a public record. What's a little different about social media is now your residents are creating, editing, and deleting your public records. And it's happening more and often more often than not. Um, and it's, it's pretty concerning if you don't have an archiving solution in place. Why is that? Because not only do they create them, but they easily delete those records. So before this presentation, um, I did a quick search of our archive and found that we had 4,444 deleted comments, 318 edited comments, and 207 hidden comments since we began archiving in January of 2016. What I really like about this solution is I can click on any one of those deleted comments and the archive will show me the thread where the public comment was originally made. The archiving solution also has the ability to tell me the version history. So in other words, when an edit was made. For example, we had a Facebooker post a negative comment about the city online. That was in November 2017 and the first post was made at 8.33 and 14 seconds p.m. It's that specific. Then the post, then the, the Facebooker posted an edited version later that same night at 10.45 and 16 seconds. After there had been some passionate back and forth updates between several individuals online. But in any case, I now have the changes to that original public record documented, archived, and I can easily retrieve it to show all the version history and it all happened while I was out of the office. We all know there are consequences for not properly maintaining public records, and social media records are no different. I think we've all seen the growing number of examples in the newspaper or online where social, re social media records management has cost agencies thousands of dollars in legal fees. On the screen, I've shared with you an example out of Washington County, Florida. In this example, a citizen filed a First Amendment lawsuit against the Washington County clerk after they deleted her comment on Facebook and then banned her from the page. The suit alleged that the citizen's rights were violated when she was banned because she posted a comment objecting to a photo on the site. That comment was deleted, but the citizen felt that there, uh, there would have been a violation of free speech. The citizen then filed a second suit when the agency could not produce a record of her comment. The second suit was filed at the request, was filed for the public records portion of it. 
The clerk's office ultimately agreed to a settlement of $750 in the public records suit, but they had to pay a settlement of over $10,000 for legal and legal representation fees for the federal lawsuit. All of that could have easily been avoided if an archiving solution had been in place. The other important lesson learned from this case, never under any circumstances delete someone's comment. You can hide them according to your local posted policies, and I'll talk more on that later, but never ever delete comments. So what's different about social media? There are three basic differences between analog records and social media records. It's how they're created, it's how they're deleted, and it's how they're stored. First, when a social media record is created, they're instantly viewable to the public, and this leaves agencies more vulnerable to records requests. Second, social media gives the public the ability to edit and delete records that you're responsible for retaining. We've already talked a little bit of how important it is that your archiving solution have the ability to track these edits and deletes, but social media is definitely a big difference from the paper records that your office creates because the public does not have instant ability to edit or delete those records. And finally, social media records reside outside of your technology infrastructure on platforms owned by third-party companies. These companies are not obligated to treat your content as a public record, but you are. They view your content the same as they view Walmart's content. Paper records, on the other hand, exist in a physical location that you control or on IT infrastructure that you service have a service agreement for or maintain. So one of the biggest concerns about social media is you can't rely on the networks to get the information that may be a public record. Do you think Facebook or any of the social media platforms will drop everything to help you fill a public records request? Who do you contact? How do you get a hold of somebody at Facebook if you need help? Do you need a subpoena to get the information? If that information even exists. Social media platforms are not bound by public records law and they have no legal obligation to, re to re retain or provide your records. In addition, some of the social networks do not really offer a full record download. They intentionally exclude critical records such as comments or posts received from, from citizens in an effort to protect user privacy. As a matter of fact, in May of 2018, Twitter changed its policy on user privacy to comply with new European privacy regulations. That in turn impacted all US Twitter rec records as well. So as a part of these changes, all applications that consume data from the Twitter platform must comply with a policy that requires removal of certain content in order to protect user privacy. What's cool about Archive Social is it automatically takes care of complying with this Twitter policy. If you are attempting to manually archive your records, do you know which ones need to be destroyed according to the Twitter policy? Well, with the solution we use, about once a month, I receive a notice from Archive Social telling me there are records that need to be removed from our archive to comply with this Twitter policy. I am able to do an advanced an advanced search on the archive based upon preset tags to determine just what those records are and whether or not they are public records. So I get to decide whether they need to be deleted or if I need to do an export report from Archive Social that contains all the information that I need. We've talked about our citizens being able to readily edit and delete social media posts without your awareness. The vast majority of social networks have stated they will not assist with producing deleted comment with you, comments with you. I shared with you earlier the example where a Facebook user edited their post within a couple of hours after sparking a passionate online debate. The only reason I was aware that was happening was because my archive solution, tra solution tracked those changes. And as I said, if you notice the timestamps on those edits, they all happened after hours, and I don't monitor our social media platforms 24-7 but my archiving solution does. Remember, most social networks do not provide a history of edits, and none of the social media networks track or report deletions when content is removed. That's where an archiving solution is worth its weight in gold. So if you're trying to manually archive this volume of information, simply put, you're probably a little overwhelmed and it doesn't work. Can you imagine taking 
the time to screen grab all your social media pages every time someone posts something? Well, what about all that deleted and edited and hidden content? In the mountainous piles of paper, how would you locate relevant records because screenshots are not searchable? If you're trying to manually archive, did you know that screenshots are often not admissible in legal situations? Screenshots can be edited with imaging software, making them potentially inadmissible in court. Manuali manually archiving also puts metadata at risk. So forwarding those social media posts to an email address for retention purposes, taking screenshots of a post and sending that attachment, or exporting social media posts and other content to an Excel file are not a reliable option. Let me share with you a couple of ways that just having the searchable archive is way more efficient than manually archiving. Remember, we started our relationship with Archive Social in January of 2016. Two, thousand, or two months later, we had an individual upset with the local municipal court system, and he began making traditional public records requests. Later that same month, he also began his three-month social media campaign to attack local public officials, including but not limited to the municipal court judge, the sheriff, the county prosecutor, the city prosecutor, the police chief, and a host of other individuals. He did this not only on the city's Facebook page, but on local, other local government social media pages as well. Thankfully, we had policies in place and were able to shut down most of his uh, rants so people didn't see them right away. And just when we thought our troll had finally left and the ordeal was over, in November of 2016, a local attorney made a public records request for all the social media posts made by this individual for a specific time frame. Thankfully, we had an archiving solution in place and I was able to do a keyword phrase search because our Facebook troll tended to use very specific language, but I could have also searched by his name. And I was able to provide that attorney with 193 different comments, Facebook posts, reviews, made by this individual over a three month period in a matter of minutes. I can't even begin to imagine how long it would have taken me to manually find all of that content. But we've also used uh, comments left on social media to help one of our now retired police officers. He won the Ohio Distinguished Law Enforcement Community Service Award in 2016. Our police chief, he occasionally posts photos of our officers in action in the community. And then we use the public comments from those posts and submitted all of that information with the application for this award. So we've not only been able to use social media to protect ourselves from public records litigation, but we've also been able to use it to promote ourselves by honoring a very distinguished officer at a state level. So I've talked a little bit about how we've used some of the social media archiving features, and by far, this is a set it and forget it solution that's truly designed to solve challenges by capturing more records than any other manual method without requiring a lot of maintenance from me. It captures records continuously, even while I'm off the clock enjoying a pina colada on the beach, and it retains all those changes and deletions made by our followers without me even knowing the changes or deletions have been made. It keeps the records in their native format, captures the metadata to ensure legal authenticity, and best of all, it's all searchable. Today we're talking about Archive Social. There is more than one social media archiving solution. Finding the one that meets your agency needs will take a little homework on your part, but it will be well worth it in the end. I also wanted to share with you a few of the things to look for in a social media archiving solution. First, it should always be that set it and forget it solution. The solution should allow you to perform not only basic searches, but be capable of doing advanced searches like the one I gave you for the new Twitter privacy regulations. You should also keep an eye to the future. I shared that our Facebook following was under 900 in 2014, but has quickly grown to more than 8,000. This growth is, great, is a great thing for helping us to spread our message, but it also leans, means a lot more potential public records to keep track of. And probably most importantly, the solution you select should be able to produce the records in its original context, including the metadata, and be able to show all of the edits or deletions made. I touched on it a little earlier, but my final comments today are about the importance of social media, media policies. 
in, in this changing landscape of how we communicate with our residents. I wish everyone knew how to behave on social media, but it's not necessarily the case. So it's extremely important that your agency develop social media policies that apply not only to employee use and access, but citizen conduct as well. These policies will help insulate your agency and ensure that federal, state, and local regulations are being followed with relation to privacy and freedom of speech issues. Your employees must also understand that the social media content they create as public employees could be a record. One example I can share is that we teach our employees to not identify themselves as employees of the city in their personal social media profile. That way, the comments an employee makes on their personal social media profile doesn't always look like it's coming from the city as an, an official endorsement for or against whatever it may be they are commenting on. And finally, be sure your social media platforms include a purpose and comment policy. Here are a couple of examples of the disclaimers that we have included in ours. One, that the site is not monitored 24 seven. This becomes very important when individuals attempt to report crimes via social media, and it happens more than you would think. And, and that the, the site is, uh, should not be used for official correspondence because it's considered, and it's considered a limited public forum. And two, participants should remain, maintain respectful interactions on the page. Again, I wish we all knew how to act on social media, but it doesn't always happen. And three, what, what comments will be subject to being hidden? For example, in our policy, personal attacks or profanity or even being off topic from what the subject of the post is will, will allow the city to hide specific posts. Never delete, but hide. And number five, or I'm sorry, number four, there should contain a notice that the agency reserves the right to block offenders of the policy without notice. So I spoke about our troll back in November of 2016. Yes, he did eventually get blocked because we had policies spelled out on our page that allowed us to do that. And five, it's important to have a disclaimer that content posted by individuals on the page does not necessarily reflect the opinions and positions of the city or its employees. That's been a whole lot of information today, but I wanted to share with you some of the real world examples of how I use Archive Social and I hope you picked up some useful information that you can use. Fantastic, well thank you so much for sharing everything with us, Carrie. We have some good questions coming in already, but wanted to quickly remind everyone to go ahead and keep those coming. Um, I'm going to quickly move over to our next speaker. Um, Anil Chavla is the founder and CEO of Archive Social. We heard Carrie talk about Archive Social a lot on, uh, during her part of the presentation. Um, Anil speaks nationally and is a subject matter expert on legal policy and records management issues related to social media and government. He's been on stage at 3CMA, NAGWA, GSMCon, and Government Technology. And just a little bit about Archive Social, they are the number one provider of social media archiving in government. It protects more than 2,000 public agencies, including New York City, Chicago, Dallas, and small towns in 40, more than 40 states. Anil, welcome. Well, thank you, Erica, and uh, welcome to everybody who's joined us this afternoon. We have a, a great audience online with us, and I have to say a special thanks to IIMC. This is a, a organization that we've had the good fortune of partnering with, uh, I think, for about the last 18 months or so. And what a tremendously high quality organization that brings real quality educational content to the audience. Uh, we've really enjoyed working with the organization as well as of course the member base. We appreciate so many of you joining us today. And what I'm here to do is provide some additional educational context around this issue of social media as a legal concern, a policy concern, and certainly a records concern. Now, before I jump into that, I also have to of course say thanks to Carrie uh, Carrie, just an incredible job there uh, covering the range of issues, both at the high level and down to the details. Uh, I often um, am brought in to speak on these issues because of the work that we do with uh, over 2,000 agencies, and what I really do is channel that knowledge, but I think it's pretty clear to all of us here that uh, the perspective of actually living and breathing the, the, the role that you have as, as a city clerk, being that domain expert, um, is such an important perspective, and it really sh uh, shines through in that presentation. You covered a lot of ground, Carrie, so thank you for doing that. I appreciate you sticking around for the questions that we have
flowing in. What I'm going to do is provide some additional context with some ca other case studies, in addition to the, some of the case studies that Carrie mentioned, and also provide some additional perspective on social media record keeping. Now, in full transparency, we are a company that provides that service. We have a preference uh, for working with agent, as many agencies as we can. But today, I, I really do want to step back. And my goal here, my victory here, is to help folks understand the issue um, and take some steps to get ahead of the potential challenges to protect your agency, to really be able to fulfill your responsibilities, regardless of who you work with. It's a win for me today if you have an action item out of this presentation. So I'll do my best, and please do queue up questions for me as well, um, and I'll be as much of a resource to this audience as I can today. Now, jumping right in, uh, Carrie uh, went straight to the, to the heart of the matter that social media is a public record. Now, this is uh, a topic that uh, is well instilled now in the public sector. Rewind seven, eight years ago when public agencies were first starting to engage on social media, there was an open question of, of whether or not social media uh, needed to be treated as public record. And really the questions came from not the lack of, 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 of a law or the legal underpinning, but there just wasn't as much conversation happening back then. It turns out that the public records laws that we've had since the 1970s are written in such a way that regardless of physical form, as Carrie pointed out, social media can constitute public record just like any other communication. Now, what's exciting is that since 2009, 10, 11, we've seen state after state come out with very clear guidance demonstrating and clarifying exactly how your records law in your state applies to social media. And in many states, really spelling out the actions that you should be taking and the considerations you should have. So what we've done here at Archive Social is we've taken the latest and greatest as it, as it evolves, as it comes out in every state across the United States. We've put it on a map. Uh, it's available at this URL, bit.ly slash smpublicrecords. Go to the state that, that, that you're in, uh, and you'll see the latest guidance from your state unfiltered with links directly to those resources. It's just one way where we want to be a resource to the market on what the latest requirements are and that clarity that's coming out. And again, I'm very excited about the dialogue that's happened around this issue. Of course, it's not all dialogue in a vacuum. There have been many, many real records requests and legal situations that have spurred that action. And we've gotten to a point where there's some really great guidance in, in a variety of states. Now, this is actually now four years, almost four years um, ago that California came out with a, the CalRIM e-records guidebook. Again, if you're in California, there's the Records Information Management Office. And if you haven't seen this guidebook since it came out, Check it out. It has really wonderful, clear guidance on when social media is deemed to be public record, what your requirements are, and key statements such as the need for some kind of record keeping system uh, to be created. Again, you can't just rely on the social networks, as Carrie pointed out. Again, this is a bit dated, but if you go dial back to 2014, 2013, uh, unlike a state like Florida, you don't hear as much about public records issues in California. Now, of course, it's risen. There's a lot of case law there. There's a lot of case studies that we've published, but the fact of the matter is, no matter where you are, the public records law matters. The same kinds of issues are happening across the state, and records requests are happening. And so, again, great to see states both large and small address this issue. One more example, Massachusetts, um, very good guidance here in their electronic records guidelines uh, that, that has a key statement, a key paragraph in here that points out, just like Carrie did, that the social networks in their terms of service uh, have no... Uh, obligation, no desire to maintain records in, a, in, in the spirit of what governments need to do. Um, in fact, with all of the privacy circumstances that have arisen, such as Cambridge Analytica, if you remember that uh, from 2017, these, these social networks are more inclined to, to really steer towards user privacy, which can be at the odds of record keeping, and certainly is. And so when you look at guidance like this from Massachusetts, it makes it abundantly clear that think about the social network, what they've said they're going to do, their terms of service are not consistent with your retention schedules um, for all the predominant public social networks. There's not a social network out there that has a record keeping. The one exception would be Nextdoor, which is a, a social network that specifically creates uh, support for public sector. But your Facebook, your Twitter, your YouTube, all the, the other primary social networks do not do anything to keep these records for you. And so again, states like Massachusetts making it very clear that you're obligated to take affirmative steps to retain this content. Now, not every state has come this clear but the states share the same underpinnings when it comes to the, the, the freedom of information laws. And we have seen uh, time and time again that, that the guidance that you're seeing that certain states are getting, getting more clear, other states then soon follow in lockstep. And so this is something that even if you're not in Massachusetts, it makes a lot of sense. And something you should pay attention to, the conflict between your record keeping requirements and what the social network intends to do. 
So again, that resource is there for you, bit.ly slash SM public records. Let's take it from the theoretical, though, to, to what's happening in reality. And uh, again, Kerry covered a, a, a case out of Florida, the Washington County Clerk's case, that I don't have in my deck because I knew Kerry was going to cover it. But um, it, it's a really important case because it, it was a situation where the content was on the website for the clerk, uh, for the, I'm sorry, on the Facebook site for the clerk's office. So that really hits home um, for our audience here today. I know many of you are joining us um, you know, coming from, from that role and that set of responsibilities. Uh, but again, as a clerk, you have an obligation and a responsibility to the agency as a whole. Um, you are really relied on for that record keeping. You may even be involved with the social media, as many of our customers are. Even if you're not, though, you play such an essential role in protecting the agency's use of social media. I wanted to cover some, some, some cases that were off the clerk's Facebook page, but still have incredible relevance to all of you. And so this comes out of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, where, uh, again, a lot of these situations come from uh, people having different opinions, right? which is a very normal thing in government, particularly in today's political environment. People have different opinions, and oftentimes those opinions conflict with the elected official. And so in this case, uh, a citizen was, was commenting on the mayor's Facebook page. The mayor did not agree with those opinions, removed those comments, and the citizen then filed a records request to the borough saying, hey, this content was removed from the mayor's page. Can you please produce it? I also feel like my First Amendment is being violated. The borough actually responded very quickly to this request, saying, "Well, listen, this is on the this is essentially this is on the mayor's page, not ours. <laughs> this is not the agency's page. We don't we don't control the mayor's page. We didn't set it up, and denied the records request." The citizen then challenged it, and this went up the court system, uh, went up through through the appeal system, all the way up to the uh, office of open records, which makes the determination in Pennsylvania on on records issues. And the office of open open records stood behind the citizen and said. Listen, it doesn't matter if you set up the Facebook page, if you control it, the mayor is a public official and therefore is a representative of this public agency. And as a public agency, you are responsible for a public records request and this is a valid public records request. So again, made it very clear that, the, that, that even if um, you think that council and elected officials are off on their own, they do represent your agency. And as a clerk or, or someone else with responsibility around uh, record keeping public information, you have to think one step ahead to how you can help protect the agency um, because it, it, this kind of circumstance is happening all the time these days. Um, and I do want to point out that once this was ruled upon, the borough came back and said, okay, we agree. We're going to get those, those deleted Facebook posts um, and, and provide them. So this article comes out September 2017, makes the news, and then there's a problem. There's no record keeping in place. You can't just go to Facebook, hey, give us a deleted content. Facebook's not going to keep that deleted content. Um, and so then Facebook, uh, you know, obviously he didn't have it. The council then decided to pursue, um, this is almost, uh, you know, several months later, almost seven months later, uh, I think more than that actually, right? Uh, just about actually seven months later, half a year later, that uh, another article comes out that, well, we're going to have to subpoena Facebook. Unfortunately, we all know the ending to that. Uh, Facebook actually has it on their website that if you want to subpoena for content, you must do so before it's deleted. One more case, very similar, Glen Rock, New Jersey, very similar circumstance related to First Amendment comments being deleted. And in this circumstance, again, the agency and the individuals tried to do the right thing, but they, they again, this is, this is often an issue of awareness and education. The clerk received this request, checked with the attorney, checked with the local municipal group, was told that, you know, again, this is, this is relating to records on the, the council's uh, Facebook page, not on Glen Rocks. Um, no need to respond to this records request. They denied the records request. Uh, unfortunately, not good advice. Uh, this was challenged in court. Court ruled that that the records request is valid, that regardless of whether it's for the council member's content or for Glen Rocks, the agency as a whole is responsible for public record. And it led to, again, a settlement of $30,000 in legal fees. And this has happened again time and time again. We're just covering some of the cases from the past 18 and 24 months. So, again, in context with the Washington County Clerk's case, and, and, and that one, again, was, was very um, awakening for, for a lot of us because of the fact that not only was this happening on a clerk's Facebook page, again, generally a lot less controversial than a council member's. This can happen on any kind of page. But in that circumstance, the clerk and deputy clerk were actually named in the lawsuit. So not only can it, can it be a problem from 
responsibility to the organization, but as government staff members that are central to record keeping and fulfilling obligation, that legal challenge can directly tie to you. Um, and we've now seen that staff members, uh, in that case, the clerk's office members, were named directly in the lawsuit. So we do need to get ahead of this problem. Um, it's a huge problem. It happens all the time, particularly on First Amendment concerns. So let's talk about the problem. And what I really want to do is start to turn the corner here on what you can do to get ahead of it, how to think about record keeping, um, and how to weigh the, the cost, risk, benefit of record keeping, uh, and um, really set you up for you to make a decision on what's best for your agency. Now, when it comes to record keeping, you heard Carrie talk about archiving software. I'm going to give you a bit of a comparison between using some archiving software, again, there are options out there, um, versus trying to do this yourself, versus relying on the social network. There are a few truths to be aware of before, before you go down that road, though. The first is to recognize that social media is very, very different than other kinds of content. Unlike email, unlike website content, unlike your SharePoint documents, this is really the one kind of content that sits completely outside of your control. Uh, it sits on Facebook servers and Twitter servers and YouTube servers. Uh, and it's even worse than text messaging, which is often with one carrier. All of these private companies are very different. They don't coordinate on this issue of record keeping whatso whatsoever. And so these third parties have your content. They have really no obligation to what you're concerned about. Um, the networks also change all the time. I'm sure many of you use Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You know that new features come out that can be good or bad. You know that the social network changes pretty frequently. That impacts the record keeping. So what might work today can stop working tomorrow because of a, a new feature or a change on the social network. And ultimately, the social network provides no guarantees. It, nothing that the social networks do is aligned with government record keeping, again, with one exception next door, which has a public agency focus. So what's the big takeaway? You cannot rely on social networks for record keeping. In other words, you as an agency need to do something. So let's talk about the actions that you can take. Now, one point that folks will say is, all right, I, I get it. I, I have to take some action to keep records, but I'll worry about that when you know something's really happening. If our social media becomes controversial or if it stops being a sleepy presence um, or, you know, you know, we've had a positive presence, but if someone negative shows up, maybe I'll start worrying about this, right? There's different sort of triggers. We're all very, very busy understanding that you have many priorities. I can understand, we often hear the, the, the question of why should this be a priority right now? And so one of the ways that we've looked at this is just to simply study the data. And again, we're uniquely positioned uh, with the work that we do with public sector, um, the technology that we have, which not only archives content, but can actually detect deletions. And so I want to go back to the point that Carrie made that, that content uh, on social networks can get deleted. And if it's deleted, you don't have a record. It's a big problem. Uh, Carrie mentioned uh, as an agency, you can try to avoid deleting content. Uh, but what we at Archive Social want to do is take a look at, well, how, how often does content actually get deleted? What are the chances of, of, of any agency out there that's on social media losing a record? Now, this is a very fresh study that we conducted actually in May of 2019. We took a look at 500 randomly selected public sector customers that were active uh, with us throughout all 2018, still active with us today. But we look at their social media content all throughout 2018, look at over, nearly 11 million social media records. So 500 public agencies and school districts, um, over 10 million social media posts, as I said. By May of 2019, 758,000 of those uh, over 10 million records have been deleted. So again, within you know 12 to 18 months, really an average of 12 months, we looked at all of, all of 2018. We're looking, and then in May, we're seeing what's still there. 758,000 records now deleted. So in that time span, our customers, each of those 500 customers, on average, lost 1,500 records that were generated in 2018. By 2000, May of 2019, 1,500 records gone, but 126 lost per month. And what that comes out to is one out of 15 social media records were deleted. That is a staggering number. And you might say, well, wait, why are they deleting all that content? Carrie says don't delete. Most agencies try not to delete the content. The reality is it's not the agency that's deleting the content. It's the other side of the communication, the citizen that's commenting, replying, messaging you. Not everything that's said is of value, but there's absolutely content of value in there. And when one out of 15 of those comments are, 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 are disappearing from the social network, you are no, uh, in, in no way are, are you maintaining everything you need, you need to have. Undoubtedly, you're losing records of value. So it's a really eye-opening study. And again, the way this happens, you can just kind of see an illustration from Facebook. Um, you know, we have a citizen that's commented. We have a highly engaged customer of ours that's very responsive, a great practice on social media. It pays uh, huge dividends to be responsive. 
Now, just imagine the citizen deletes that comment. Not only do you lose that comment, but you actually lose everything that was underneath it, including your agency's replies. And again, this is a, a, a conversation of substance that could have material value for, for, for retention, could be a material value in a legal situation. So again, the citizen deleting a comment can have a profound effect, can delete all the other citizens' comments that were replies to it. And then the biggest case that a lot of us don't think about but cr can create a lot of com uh, record loss is when a citizen just quits Facebook or quits a social network. The social networks, again, will protect privacy and remove everything that was ever said to you. So you at one instance could lose hundreds or thousands of records without even knowing it. This happens all the time. So how do we how do we deal with this? Let's break it down. You could just rely on the social networks. You could take screenshots, or you could you could employ some kind of technology. And this makes it pretty clear. When you rely on the social network, it's either there or it's not. When you look at the, the different ways, uh, the, the different aspects of an archiving solution to look for, a retention strategy, I should say, making sure you get that content in your control quickly, making sure you have the deletions, the hidden content, the metadata, as Carrie mentioned being able to search and being able to produce. The social network really doesn't do any of that for you. It's either there or it's not. And if you want to search, you can try that search function on Facebook. It's okay, but not really helpful in a records request situation. So the next step agencies take is to manually keep screenshots. Again, Kerry talked to this as well. And it turns out that when you actually put this on paper, taking screenshots takes a lot of your time and effort. Uh, may help you capture some records that you would have lost otherwise but isn't a, a viable long-term solution. So again, if you're not doing anything, take some screenshots, some record better than no record, but over the long-term, how can you search it? How can you ensure you've captured everything, all the hidden and deleted content? You won't have the metadata. How can you really produce that content? It's a huge challenge. So that's where technology comes in. Again, you can't do this manually, as Carrie said. You have to look at technology. And so we have here on this slide, which we'll share out the different characteristics to look for in a record-keeping approach. I won't spend too much time on this right now. We can definitely take this conversation offline and we'll get this resource in your hands. But one, one of those criteria that I wanna share with all of you is that the, the aspect of keep capturing the record is extremely important, of course. The technology and approach you use must capture those records thoroughly, keep up with the social networks as they change. It must do a really good job of getting the data out of Facebook, even though Facebook is not built for archiving. Really important to capture the data, but producing the data is just as important. And a lot of times we overlook that when we're looking at record keeping approaches, but just think about social networking. You may have a record request that touches two Facebook comments, a tweet, another tweet, another Facebook message. And you can see the example here. You can't just take that out in a record request and hand it to somebody. They're gonna ask you, well, how does that first comment relate to the second one? Is it related to that fifth record? I have no idea what this is about. Social networking is a conversation. So when you look at archiving approaches, pay attention to how the data gets in there, but also pay attention to how it gets out, how you'd respond to a records request. And what you really want is a record keeping approach that reconstructs the social media conversation, replays it, gives you the full context of all the comments around it, maybe even brings multiple search results together so that someone can make sense of it. At the end of the day, when it comes to protecting your agency, uh, it, it's a big problem. It can be a technologically challenging problem but it, there are solutions out there and we really strongly advise you to look at the different solutions out there and assess them, take some steps because getting ahead of this can pay significant dividends for your agency and for you as a staff member responsible for compliance and record keeping. Um, there's a very, very high risk of non-compliance to your public records law if you're just relying on the social network. Um, while it doesn't cost you anything, it can really cost you in the long run as you saw from those uh, different case studies. Uh, and when it comes to social media, the great thing is that uh, the different solutions that are out there, they're cloud-based, very, um, it's very seamless, there's no real installation, no deployment. You just log into a website and, with most of these solutions, and most of these solutions are under $5,000 annual, right, and oftentimes half of that. So a very, very low-cost um, approach to archiving, very different from, from what you're used to in government and having to deal with other, other times, uh, types of records. So I'm gonna close up here with a success story because I feel like I put a lot of case studies in front of you. Kerry made a great point with the Washington clerk's case of, of all of the challenges and the penalties. So let's talk about how this works. Let's talk about the case that wasn't in the news because uh, the city clerk and the staff members got their ducks in a row, followed, got the right policies in place, got the right technology in place. And when the circumstance happened, they weathered it. Didn't become a news story because they had everything they needed to be able to handle the normal events that now come up with government social media. So in this case, the case study we have is with the city of Durham, North Carolina, which happens to be where I'm sitting right now, our headquarters. Um, really proud to be able to work with this city 
And we were amazed to hear about what they had uh, gone through um, being just a few blocks down the street. We hadn't realized what they had navigated until we talked with uh, the communications team over there and what a wonderful story they have. So I'll get right to what this case study is about. Uh, being in the South, there has been uh, numerous controversies around Confederate monuments. We had a situation with the Confederate monument being taken down that of course blew up on social media, led to a committee in the city looking into it, and then a records request came in regarding the committee asking for all communications. So how did the city deal with this? That's a, that's a, that's a situation that um, being in the South comes up. Um, a big records request, a lot of public visibility in the newspapers. What do they do? Well, let's actually step back. So it turns out that the city of Durham, um, back um, several years ago, recognized the need for the, having the appropriate policies uh, and archiving in place for public records. They put that in place, but as of 2017, their city council had nothing in place. So the city had their ducks in a row, council really wasn't following the same rules. A few controversies came out uh, prior to the, to the Confederate statue uh, situation, the monument situation, that woke the city staff up. They started to make a business case with town council, city council, made the case that everybody has to follow the policy. Everybody has to archive. We are all uh, part of this public agency. They successfully made the case with council. Council agreed to put their own social media policy in place and archiving. Then the Confederate monument situation occurred, led to the committee, led to the public records request. The city clerk received the records request, and because everybody is following the policy, they have the policy and the technology in place, the city clerk turned to the city's archive for, for those pages to get that content, turned to the council's archive, got that content, responded to the records request, no problem. This is a normal event in government. That's what we should expect today when it comes to social media. Huge success story, and it plays out in a much better way than we saw with the other agencies earlier that had those significant legal settlements. So in summary, um, no question that social media is a must for your agency. Um, whether you're involved with it or not, uh, you play an incredibly important role with protecting the use of social media to ensure transparency, open flow of communication. Records requests and legal situations are happening. You heard about all the cases here from me. You heard about the records requests that Carrie received. And it's t now is time to take action. Um, when you have a problem, it's already too late. So Carrie and I are both here to be resources to you. Um, I did want to mention that if you wanted a deep, deep uh, dive further into public records law. You look at the map, you look at the guidance, you need some help interpreting it. Uh, or you want to talk to other agencies similar to, to, to Carrie's. Maybe you're not in Ohio, you want to talk to an agency in your county, your state. We work with over 2,000 agencies. You want to hear how those agencies are dealing with public records, how they're approaching archiving. And of course, if you want to hear about other records requests and legal situations, um, we've seen dozens upon dozens of legal requests and situations because we're at the center of it. Almost none of those turn into news headlines because the agencies we work with already have this situation um, in control, but we can tell you about those record requests. We can tell you about the legal situations that happened perhaps in your county involving your neighbor. If you're interested in any of that, I'm happy to take that conversation offline. We, um, we'll reach out to you with a phone call. Um, this is not a product pitch. We will talk to you about these items um, and really get you up to speed on the legal landscape involving your agency. We'll talk about your use of social media, again, around records law. You can just fill out this poll here if you're interested in that outreach. We can talk to you about the records law, talk to you about your peers around you, so you know who to talk, reach out to in regards to records law and in regards to archiving, and of course cover the legal situations right around you. So um, go ahead and, and answer this poll. I know we have about 10 minutes left, perfect timing for us to do the q and I'm going to keep the poll up and turn it back to Erica for Q&A. Yeah, Anil, Carrie, this has been just jam-packed with information, and if the quantity and quality of questions are any indication, we have a definitely hit on something that's resonating with everyone in attendance today. So I'm going to dive right in. Carrie, the first question is for you, and it's, it's what is your biggest challenge in using social media? Probably the biggest challenge in um, social media is monitoring the after hours conversations. Um, I, I'm an hourly employee, so we, we run into issues where I can't necessarily respond after hours. Um, so, so that's a big um, big challenge, and I think sometimes um, just overcoming the general negativity in Facebook um, sometimes can be a, a, a huge challenge. Yeah, definitely, you know, we hear a lot from, from folks we talk to on a regular basis, you know, what do you do when someone comes in and trolls you, and you spoke about that earlier, too. Um, so, so moving on, we have a lot of questions. This one actually came in through email during the, the presentation. So. Our new mayor has created a Facebook page 
and he already has over 7,200 followers. He posts about topics like what's going on in the city, et cetera. Could his post be subject to FOIA? And then Neil, I'll let you take that one. Absolutely. All right. So, you know, this is a situation where the mayor uh, is a public official conducting public business, and that's as simple as it gets. Uh, you know, and, and oftentimes the confusion happens where maybe a, a, a elected official has their own social media page. Oftentimes with Twitter, particularly, because that can feel more like your personal account. But when you are a public official communicating in a public fashion regarding public business, instantly hits the key requirements for sent, received communication, the public records law. And then it only becomes a question of retention. So, so no question on that one. Great. And we did receive a lot of questions also around social media archiving. Um, you know, both of you will talk about different stories around successful, successfully preventing losses, but I have one specifically coming out of a small city with a population of about 1,500, there is no IT department for assistance and they worry about technical aspects of CORA requests. How do you handle um, overcoming this? And Carrie, I'm gonna kick this to you because you're handling public records requests. How do you handle them as a team without necessarily having support behind you? Actually, because the archiving solution has that search feature, um, it is pretty simple. Uh, if if you need if you need to search by a person's name, there's a to a from. You can drill it down based on is it just Facebook, is it Twitter, um, or are you looked at, looking for LinkedIn content? Depending on what the public records request is, so there are really a lot of built-in features that that make finding the information you need to to present for the public records request pretty easy. Like I said, with the with the gentleman who was randomly posting um, things for a three month period, I searched his name and I also used a, a very strange word that he typically used or a, a phrase that he typically used. And within a minute or two, I had the reports downloaded. So the, the software itself is very intuitive. Great. And Anil, I have one for you, specifically around the sunshine laws in the state of Florida. Um, this question is, does, the social, does social media affect the sunshine laws in Florida, and how does that work? Absolutely, and thanks, thanks for asking. Fl Florida is you know, obviously known as a sunshine state with the sunshine laws, and uh, for better or worse, leads the country oftentimes uh, when it comes to public records. And so Florida, for, for many years, has had good guidance out regarding social media's public record, coming from really the attorney general's office, um, and, and the Attorney General making it very clear in a, in a, a variety of forms of guidance stating that uh, content on Facebook and Twitter other sites will constitute public records. So this has been pretty well established in Florida. And in fact, uh, a lot of the case law that we talk about, I put the poll up on the screen, we now have it down. Um, if you're in Florida, uh, there's no question that we can get you records requests in legal circumstances um, within a 50 mile radius of you because there have been so many records requests in legal circumstances in Florida involving public records. So again, better or worse, Transparency laws are taken very seriously in the state, um, and we work with several hundred agencies in Florida at this point. Great. And Anil, I think this is another one coming in for you. Um, our agency decided to not allow comments. How does this affect the First Amendment rights? Yeah, that's a very careful, uh, it's sort of going to be very, very careful with, and uh, we have had agencies decide that they're not going to allow comments. So let's be really clear on this. When you go on a social networking site like Facebook, you cannot just simply turn off comments. The sites no longer allow you to do that. It is uh, by design a social network. Um, but th with it, with a variety of tricks um, and some workarounds, you could make it such that when comments show up, they get sort of filtered, allow you to approve them, and you can kind of hide them. And we've had agencies go through this trouble, um, I think, uh, in the premise of, of, of trying to mitigate risk. Um, oftentimes, when an attorney is advised, uh, the, the, the communicator, to hide all comments, and in every circumstance we've seen this, it's backfired. So I strongly recommend against this. I'll give you one example, Vineland PD. This is from a few years ago. The attorney told uh, the officers to, to, to censor all the comments. Um, guess what happens? A citizen's posting comments and one day very easily figures out that none of his comments are showing up on Facebook. So he starts to, he contacts the police department and he says, I'm gonna issue a records request once a month, every month for everything that you're hiding because you guys must be hiding something. This isn't then followed through every month issuing a public records request. This was a huge tax and cost for the agency. They eventually came to us uh, to get an archive in place 
Um, so we can make that less, far less painful. But really the big fix there is don't censor those comments out the gate. Um, that's not why your agency is on social media and it'll cause far more problems than it's going to prevent. Great. And Carrie, one in for you. Um, Carrie, do you impose retention guidelines on your social media records? And specifically, do you destroy digital records according to your retention schedule? We do. Um, social media records are um, they're considered communication. So we have communication broke or correspondence. We have correspondence broken down as transient, um, general, and substantiative. So we we can go through and 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 determine which records can go, but I will tell you none of them have really re met our records retention period yet. So I haven't gone through and actually physically deleted anything from our archives. Great, good to know. And Anil, you spoke to this a little bit when you were speaking, but I want to give you a chance to specifically address this question that came in. Are comments from non-employees on a public social media post subject to Public Records Act? Yeah, I really appreciate this question because it, it, sometimes um, folks do question whether these incoming comments from the public uh, meet the public record standard. Uh, and the, the answer is unequivocally yes. And the really easy way to understand this is think about email. When, you, when we all have in, 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 in a public agency now, for many years, we've had an email signature probably that says, uh, you know, know that your, 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 your email may be disclosed under public information requirements. When you receive an email from a citizen, of course, that's public record, right? It can constitute public records. So a received communication per, per how the records laws are laid out. So why would a received comment on Facebook be any different or a received private message? Um, they're not. A received communication meets the standard of public record. Again, it's the nature of the content that determines the retention period. To the last question, Carrie mentioned that um, content in Sydney has not even uh, uh, expired past the retention period um, for, for disposition. Uh, to be honest with you, for most of our customers, it, it would be a high order to go through the thousands upon thousands of social media comments and posts to decide what to retain and what not to retain. Most agencies take the approach that we're just going to retain indefinitely rather than scheduling. So again, Absolutely, the comments constitute record, and most likely you're going to hold on to them. And good, good that you do because this content's out in the public and come out can come up in a variety of ways outside of just public records requ uh, requests. All right, I'm going to move very quickly to the next final couple of questions. I do see lots of questions coming in. If we are unable to get to yours specifically today, I am going to do my best to get back to you with the response from Carrie and Anil. Um, so, Carrie, this one is for you. Um, what is your best recommendation when it comes to getting everyone on board with trans transitioning archives digitally? I see a huge need in a transaction, but I have some coworkers hesitant of the change. I think to get the buy-in, it, it's simply to show them how easy it is to use. A lot of people, when, when you say we're going to implement a technology solution, they think it's going to be this big, overwhelming process. It's really not that. It's, it's really set it, forget it. And, and it's searchable. So I think just showing them how very simple it is to make it happen will, will help with the buy-in. Great. And last question we'll have time for is for Anil. Are your costs based on population or based on number of accounts and amount of activity slash number of followers? How do you do your pricing? Oh, sure. Well, I'll address this pretty quickly. I appreciate the question. I think to Carrie's point, simplicity is the answer for us as well. We do have our pricing online on the website, archivesocial.com slash pricing. Um, we're as transparent as we can be, including with our pricing. And the simple answer here is that we want the value of our, uh, the cost of our product to directly re reflect the value you're getting from us. So our pricing is based on the volume of social media, media you have. Are you generating 1,000 records a month, 3,000 records a month, 10,000 records a month? The more social media you have, the more records you have, and the more valuable we are to you. We don't charge on total storage or total records. It's more about your ongoing volume. As, as you have more social media, you probably have more risk, more need for record keeping. That's how our pricing scales. Majority of our customers fall under our 3,000 records plan, so about 90% of public agencies under our 3,000 records plan, just to give you an idea, which is under 5,000 annual. Again, our goal is to keep it a discretionary cost, but certainly I can take that conversation further offline. Um, we'd love to have you speak to our team, um, but again, want to proxy the value of what we do in our costs. Well, Anil, Carrie, we are at the very top of the hour. I want to thank you both for joining me today to discuss everything you need to know about social media. 
Um, and to everyone on the phone, thank you so much for joining me. If you joined as part of the IIMC online learning webinar program, keep your eye peeled for the email with a link to the learning assessment. And if you have any questions that weren't addressed that you would like for me to follow up on, please don't hesitate to reach out directly to me. Um, you should have my email address and previous communications. Otherwise, thank you all, and please have a great rest of your day.